All right, six o'clock by my clock over here. So uh, why don't we call the, the meeting to order and uh, start with the roll call. Neil. Present. David Droge. Jacques Livingston. I'm here. Courtney Michelle. Here. Andrew Stewart. Here. Liz Osborne. Here. Joe Long. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, great to be able to have uh, our, our two newest members of the uh, Transportation Ad Ad Advisory Board. Um, you're uh, part of a great team and, and we're able to uh, help uh, the city of Longmont navigate in a, in a good direction. Uh, do you want to just maybe uh, do a quick introduction for each of you just so we can know uh, just a uh, you know, 60 second overview of uh, some of what inspired you to join and and uh, a little about about your background there. Uh, Liz, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I have lived in Longmont for the past 28 years, raised my kids here. They're all grown up. Last one getting married this fall. And I decided that I was at the beginning of COVID, I was doing some genealogy, looked at what my grandparents were doing in their lives at this age, and they were involved in their community. And I realized I needed to step up my game. So I signed up for this. That sounds great. Awesome. Well, welcome. And uh, Joe, uh, you want to go next and give us a little 60 second overview? Sure, give it my best shot here. Um, so I've spent a lot of time, uh, forgive me in advance, in California. I've been in Colorado for 21 years now, um, in Longmont for just about 11. Um, my, as my wife says, I like to comment about things quite frequently and said, why don't you actually go take action? And that's what brought me here. Sounds good. Well, we look forward to your frequent comments. <laughs> Great. Sounds good. Uh, Tyler, do you want to offer any uh, uh, words of wisdom there or, or basically what, you, what would be helpful from, from your perspective for uh, 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 the new uh, uh, advisory board members? Sure, Neil, thanks for the opportunity. I think you know, one of the big things is just to, to really help kind of navigate some of the big picture items that we see from the city. I think we've got a, I'd say city staff has a pretty good team and um, these people you see on the call, Jim, Phil, other staff around us, we're, we've got a great team here, so we're, we, we're all professionals with what we do. So I appreciate some of the big picture guidance from this group, group and direction. So look forward to all of your participation this year as we move through this. And I think we've got some fun projects or some uh, topics on the horizon here that, that you guys will get a chance to, to weigh in on and help shape some future projects in Longmont. So thank you all for your participation. Jim, awesome. I think Dad. Yeah, that pretty well covered it. Nice job, Tom. <laughs> Jim, do you want to just introduce yourself there for uh, uh, for those who haven't met you yet? Yes, uh, I am Jim Angstad. I am the director of engineering services. Um, so I work uh, with Phil and Tyler and Ben, uh, who is somewhere in there. I think I saw him in here um, for uh, uh, transportation, uh, traffic, uh, streets. Um, and we have a, uh, this evening we have a CIP presentation that will go into next year. So hopefully we'll be able to, to bring you up to speed, provide you some good information about what we're looking at for next year and in future years. Wonderful, thanks. And Phil, since you're an, an active member of uh, um, you know, the, uh, the staff updates there, just give a quick uh, uh, welcome from your side there and a bit of background on the types of areas that you get involved with. Thanks, Neil. Uh, yeah. Um, Phil Greenwald, I'm the transportation planning manager. So we work more on the planning side than Jim and, and Tyler that, that do more of the engineering piece of it. But we all work on planning. We all work on the engineering piece. So we're all in this together, as they say. So, and, and Ben Ortiz also works as the transportation planner for the city. So um, all four of us are talking, as Jim said, often. So uh, if you ever need anything, feel free to give any one of us a call. We're always trying to be available. I wasn't very available to Tyler today, but uh, we all try to be we try to be available to each other so and, and to you. So feel free to reach out uh, emails or um, 
are probably the best way to get a hold of us if you have questions. If something comes up that you didn't really understand or or uh, or we used acronyms, we use a lot of acronyms in this business. So you'll hear a lot of TIP and STIP and you know CIP, CIP and and Dr. Cog and C dot. So if those things are just too much, feel free to stop us at any time. We we kind of use them like it's a different language and we kind of forget that not everybody knows our language. So let us know. And thanks about the maps, Jacques. <laughs> awesome, thanks. And, and since we actually have, uh, you know, with our, our two new members of the advisory board, it's probably um, for the existing advisory board members just to give a really, really brief uh, uh, introduction, maybe just 30 seconds uh, to introduce. They're maybe starting with uh, Courtney Michelle, uh, just so that uh, uh, Joe and and uh, Liz at least know who else is on the Transportation Advisory Board with you. All right. Hi, I'm Courtney Michelle. I've been on the Transportation Board for a year now, although we missed several meetings due to COVID, so I still feel like I'm new. So welcome to the newbie group. Awesome. Thanks. Ending your day job? I, I do hair as a living. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. David, do you want to go next? Hi there, I, uh, Dave Droge. I'm a systems engineer at uh, Keysight up in Loveland. Uh, we've been here in, Lo in Longmont for just over 20, well, almost 20 years. And uh, I also have a daughter getting married this fall, next month. Um, and I'm an avid cyclist and, and enjoy being a member of this team. Awesome, thanks, David. All right, Jacques, let me turn to you and uh, uh, why don't you give a quick little overview? Sure. Hi, I'm Jacques Livingston. I've been on the transportation board, I think about a year and a half now. I don't know. It seems to have flown by. I, I'm losing track of the months. Um, my day job, I'm a finance manager for the state of Colorado, uh, specifically I'm with the Division of Child Support Services. Awesome. Thanks. So, next. Hi, I'm Sandy Stewart, and I am retired. Um, I'm very interested in transportation, whether it's walking or biking or um, driving or riding a bus. And so I'm just glad to be a part. I've been here about a year on the committee and been in Longmont about 31, 32 years. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Sandy. Well, and uh, for the, the two new members there, my name is Neil Lurie. It's a pleasure to have a chance to, to welcome you to the Transportation Advisory Board. Um, I've been on the board now for two years. Um, Jacques, I agree, it does go fast. <laughs> and uh, I've been involved in transportation issues for about 20 years, um, just as a, um, a curious citizen, uh, increasingly getting involved in trying to help uh, our communities make um, you know, thoughtful decisions best that we can. Uh, my day job, I uh, run a nonprofit in Boulder called Resource Central, and uh, we help about 70,000 family members uh, per year conserve natural resources, uh, primarily water, energy, and reducing waste. So, uh, did I miss anybody um, on the Transportation Advisory Board? I think that was everybody. Awesome. So, and looking at the agenda that uh, was posted there, it looks like uh, the next step is. Uh, Officers, I'm assuming that uh, we're looking at the 2020 election of officers, not the 2019 election officers as in the agenda. Um, is there anybody who would be willing to and um, help lead the Transportation Advisory Board, either as a chair or a vice chair uh, um, into uh, the next year? Silence is deafening. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion. Um, I'd like to make a motion that uh, Neil continues serving as chair, or at least no longer co-chair, and that Jacques becomes co-chair. So co-chair or vice chair? Or vice chair, next chair, <laughs> second chair. I think that was a. I was going to volunteer for vice chair, so yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. And I think Neil would be great as chair. I appreciate that. 
Uh, any discussion? Oh. I, I would agree with those two choices. Okay. And Joe, it looked like you wanted to add something. Oh, I'm sorry, you're still on mute there, Joe. Okay. <laughs> you have a present mute challenge there, but the thumbs up sign is universal. Um, I, I certainly agree. So, so, you know, one of the, Joe, go for it. You know, one other thing real quick, if you need to chat, there's a chat function in the box as well. Anyone can communicate through that as well. If you want to um, type anything in and a response as well, that works too. Thanks. Well said. Well said. Great. Um, I'm happy to uh, uh, to help in that way. If uh, it'll be helpful for the, the advisory board, any additional discussion before we uh, uh, vote on the motion? All right. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right. The motion carries. Thanks, you guys, and, and thanks to you, Jacques, for uh, being able to uh, uh, support the, the advisory board with their, your leadership help as well. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks. All right. So I think we have opportunity to approve the, uh, the minutes. I was actually a little bit confused by the minutes because the minutes that I saw were related to the June meeting. Um, I did not see the, the July minutes. Did anybody actually see the July minutes in the packet? Yeah, I just looked at it about two hours ago because I had the same, um, I, I had March minutes in mine. Oh, uh, you saw both in there? I Oh, am I coming through okay? I can hear you. Okay. I had March minutes in my packet, but I downloaded and I have July, I think, here now. Tyler on Friday when I saw that the old minutes were in that he needed to update them and he did. So okay, they came out later. Okay, great. Yeah, there was a the mix up. We had the wrong minutes uploaded Thursday when the email went out. Apologies for that. It was corrected Friday morning. So I should have sent a follow up email to say minutes are amended. The correct ones are attached to the updated packet. Apologies for that. With uh, uh, the mix up, would it make sense for us to be able to? Um, I, I'm not sure if there may be some other folks there that haven't been able to, to see the minutes just yet. Um, uh, would it make sense to be able to seek to approve the uh, July minutes during our next transportation advisory board meeting there once others have had a chance to review it or, or maybe maybe it's a non issue. Is there anybody else that uh, hasn't had a chance to uh, read the minutes just yet? Aside from our new advisory board members. Okay, well, then why don't we move forward? Uh, move forward with their motion to approve the uh, uh, transportation advisory board. Then. All right, so moved by Sandy. Is there a second? David. We have a second with David. All right. Any discussion? All right. All in favor, say aye or raise your hand. Any opposed? Abstaining? Okay. The motion carries. Nice to cross it off. <laughs> All right, so uh, communication from staff. Uh, Tyler, do you want to pick us up? Sure. Normally, we've got a long list of items to talk about or share updates with items from staff. Uh, not, not a whole lot tonight. One thing I'll add, our signal at Mountain View and Alpine, we've talked about many times. We're going to be turning that on here later this week. So <laughs> getting that one done, exciting to get that one done. It'll be good, even though school's not going to be in session to take advantage of it. It's still done and it'll be ready as soon as kids are back in school. So that, that's what I have. I don't think there was anything else from staff unless Phil or Jim wants to chime in here real quick, but we've got a pretty 
big agenda to get through tonight. So. Okay, sounds good. Um, if no other communication from staff, we'll go to the next agenda item there. Are there any members of the public uh, wishing to be heard before we move forward? Okay, hearing none, we will uh, march forward to the to the next agenda item then. Um, action item, uh, looks like we have the capital improvement program. So, um, Phil, is that your baby? Sure, let's have him do it. <laughs> oh, no, that would be me. Hey, Jim, it's all yours. All right, so we're gonna bring up uh, a uh, short PowerPoint if you consider 100 slides, short PowerPoint, except I gave it away that there's only 17. Um, so we wanna provide you some information this evening on the uh, the proposed 20 to 20. Oh, did I screw that up? That should be 21 to 25 uh, capital improvement program, focusing on street fund and transportation uh, community investment fee. All right, next slide. Tonight, we'll be asking for recommendations, uh, two options uh, that you recommend City Council adopt the funding from the street fund and transportation community investment fee fund for the transportation projects as, as presented by staff in the 2021-2025 proposed capital improvement program. Or option two is to recommend City Council adopt the funding from the street fund and transportation community investment fee fund for transportation projects as presented by staff in the 21 to 25 proposed capital improvement program with revisions recommended from the transportation advisory board. So I wanna start out with just a um, little bit of background on CIP, which is the capital improvement program. Uh, it is a planning document that we utilize that covers the city's capital infrastructure needs over a five year period. Um, we run it for five years, but it's important to note that anything pretty much beyond the second year it can be is variable. Um, it covers our capital projects, uh, which involve new new projects, um, or new infrastructure or replacement of existing infrastructure or just improvements to infrastructure. And some of that infrastructure uh, can be um, in the capital improvement program that goes in front of council uh, beginning in September covers a lot of components. It covers water, it covers sewer, drainage. Does not necessarily, we, we will focus tonight on our transportation. Uh, so it's it's kind of a scaled down version. If you have any questions about other areas or components, we can all, always speak offline. Uh, Tyler uh, um, and Phil are always available to answer all your questions about water and wastewater, um, should you have any of those questions. The CIP does cover our met and unmet needs. Um, it is a, a dynamic document. Um, it is subject to, to yearly or semi-yearly revisions. It should be fluid in that what we program in now for next year, a year from now, may not may have changed for some reason. Um, so you, you have to understand that what we talk about today can be is subject to change and can be changed. So um, we it's a, it is basically as, as we indicated a planning document. Um, and it, what's really important also is it, it is coordinated with the city's operating budget. And we'll talk a little bit of that in, in some of the future slides when we talk budget. So well, how do we select our projects? Uh, it, they come from a variety of sources and a combination of sources. Uh, first and foremost is for transportation is Envision Longline with our multimodal and our, our comprehensive plan um, which covers the roadway system, transit system, and some of our active transportation, our bicycle and pedestrian systems. We also look to some of our master plans and studies, which can include our Longmont roadway plan. Uh, the parks and rec and trails master plan covers some of our trails for some of that active transportation. Uh, we also have uh, the enhanced multi-use corridor plan, which pushes for bikes and pedestrians. Um, we recently, within the last yeah, two years, completed the Southwest Operations Study that covered uh, a whole bunch of things, including cars, uh, making room for buses, um, bikes and peds. Um, part of that, our, our CIP includes some of our asset management. Um, with that, those plans aren't, aren't necessarily published, but we plan five to 10 years in advance 
for asset management, what roads we're going to pay, what concrete we're going to replace as part of those, those roadway improvements. Also, um, our bridge, bridge inspection reports on a two-year cycle, CDOT inspects all of the bridges in the state, um, produces a document for our bridges. Currently, uh, most of the bridges in the city of Longmont are in really good shape. Uh, we have one that is uh, starting to, to show some signs of wear and tear, go into a structurally uh, deficient phase. So we've included it in, the, in within the next four to five years to start working on it. Um, and then the last thing for CIP selection is, of course, funding. Uh, we're limited in what we can do, and funding does become a, a major player as we put together our, our CIP program. So in focusing on our transportation funding, um, the primary source is street fund. Uh, that gets um, funding dollars from the street fund sales and use tax, um, state highway use tax, um, the automobile tax. Uh, those are the numbers kind of broken out in that, that uh, pie chart. And there's also, um, it's important to note that there is a miscellaneous category. And you know, normally we kind of brush that over because it's only like five hundred thousand dollars, but miscellaneous includes grant funding. So the miscellaneous component is what's called intergovernmental, which is usually comprised of some type of grant funding, some interest income, uh, some street cut dollars, permit inspection fees. Um, this year um, we have about three million, and, and that is made up of mostly some of the component of quiet zones as well as uh, Tyler went out and got a, uh, a grant from CDOT, turns out to be about $800,000, so that's in there as well. Um, we get about uh, some money also in, in the intergovernmental uh, area from um, funding some of, our, um, some of our operations, which includes our crossing guards as well in an agreement with the school district. Um, we did provide you in your packet a um, fund statement for the street improvement fund. Um, and it shows pretty much our revenues um, that break out some of these dollars in that pie chart. And then it shows some of the projects as well as some of our operating. Um, in that chart, you'll see that we dedicate um, kind of below our operating and maintenance is about, is about $610,000 goes to fund transit. Uh, that includes the Longmont free ride um, via um, the flex bus. Uh, so, that is broken out within the budget. You can see that in that fund statement. So just some real quick you know, the component, you know, $14 million next year's budgets coming out, um, coming from the sales and use tax. Um, it is a three quarter cent tax. It funds improvements and maintenance. A um, little history initiated in 1986, uh, but it was, it was uh, in the five year uh, sunset clause. So it, it has been um, periodically updated every four to five years. Um, and then in 2014, it was, was extended for a 10 year period. Last year we went in and, and through a voter referendum got a permanent extension 2019. So uh, we will no longer have to take those increments back uh, every five or 10 years. Um, that also enables us uh, to be able with a permanent extension of that, to be able to bond um, for larger projects um, off of the out of the street fund. So just some quick project types um, that we we program in. Um, so they can be asset management, um, and we'll see one of those. I'll break one of those out in a little in a few more slides. Uh, could be capacity improvements. Could be intersection improvements. Um, safety improvements. Multimodal which involves missing sidewalks, trails, greenway connections, bike lanes, bridge improvements, traffic signals, or a combination of those where we may, in, in, in the case of this year, where we're doing an asset management project on 9th um, Avenue, um, west of Hover, between Hover and airport, we also are undertaking some bike lanes. Um, another example currently underway this year is also Pike Road, um, but Pike Road also includes a traffic signal and includes some intersection improvements, some safety improvements. So some of our projects aren't just dedicated to one project type. They are involved uh, over um, multi multi topics of, of, of project types. 
So just breaking out, kind of looking ahead into 2021 and our projects, um, we break it out. We have about six projects. Um, that may not seem like a lot, but that total is about $16 million. Um, so one project is, is, and they go from, from our street rehab, our, our transportation system management, um, the Boston Avenue connection, railroad quiet zones, Boston Avenue bridge over St. Verain. And then we also threw in the St. Verain Creek improvements. We have money from transportation dedicated to that project. Um, and I'm glossing through that list in part because I've broken them out um, to talk about each one. So our street rehab program, this, uh, this dedicates a certain set of amount of dollars for basically for the rehab of our city streets. Um, why is that important? Um, we have 350 miles of roads in the city, um, along with 692 miles of sidewalk. So uh, the program is, is our citywide program for asset management. It is, is a data driven, where in every few years we evaluate the condition of the streets uh, through a consultant who, who does some radar analysis, does some visual inspections, drives through all our city streets, builds a data, helps us build a database that shows uh, what conditions our roads are in. Uh, and then we take that tool, plan from it, what roads can we afford to repave? Um, so, and it isn't just repaving, it's a combination of rehab, um, some options, asphalt overlays, one option, crack sealing to extend the life of your asphalt, some chip seal in some areas, uh, lesser expensive option that can get five to 10 more years of wear out of your asphalt, and then other preservation techniques on a smaller scale. Um, it could involve complete roadway reconstruction. We're doing a little bit of that on ninth, where we got the road open and the whole base course is, is falling apart have to rebuild some of the road from the bottom up. Um, we also include concrete repair. Uh, so whenever we go in to, to rehab a street, we also look at what the condition of the sidewalk is, the crossings, the ADA uh, compliant curb ramps. Uh, we make sure everything's up to code, uh, meets current standards. Um, and that is um, the work, the physical work out in the field is, is contracted services for that work through a contractor and we every two years put that put that contract out to bid as well as our concrete work as well. So um, one of the bigger ones in terms of kind of the, the amount of work we do is our trans or there's TRP 11, which is the transportation system management. Uh, this covers a lot of our safety multimodal and some of our minor capacity uh, issues. Um, some of the projects we're currently working on is the uh, Sunset Road Diet. Um, we are looking at that right now. That project uh, is going to be kind of a challenge because uh, Phil is currently working on a grant, which while we don't have currently have money for construction in the future years, we have an opportunity to chase a grant. If we get that grant, that will, will change that. That project may move that forward for construction a few more years. Um, we also have the 9th Avenue multimodal improvements. Um, I mentioned earlier the not section of 9th Avenue from Hover to airport. We're also looking at a road diet from Hover to Main Street. Um, that may involve some striping changes that can provide uh, some bike lanes in that area. Uh, so we're, we're currently in the planning stages and hopefully we'll be able to execute that next year. Um, we always have school safety improvements. Um, Prior to the start of school, we do some evaluations in and around our schools and make sure that uh, the pedestrian areas are um, safe for our kids. And so we may have to throw some of those in. Uh, we always have funding for that. We also look for funding for new traffic signals. Currently, we're, we're looking at 66 in Alpine or possibly Clover Basin and Fordham. Um, those are close to meeting warrants. Um, so at that time, we want to be able to have funding available should they meet warrants. Um, we always have some funding set aside for traffic neighborhood traffic mitigation. Uh, that's one of our, our current ongoing challenges uh, with uh, residents in, in some of the local neighborhoods where you get um, they get some complaints about speeding through their neighborhoods. We always we have a program that looks at that where we can work with them to mitigate um, some of those challenges. Um, we also have high crash intersection improvements. Um, based off of our crash report. Uh, we're currently looking at third in Alpine. 
um, as uh, a intersection that may need some some improvements. We have we've had some higher higher level crashes there, uh, and then also uh, and Tyler may have to jump in at this time to tell me what an HSIP grant is. It's the grant we have for CDOT that covers signal improvements number of intersections. Sure, Jim. Highway Safety Improvement Program, and and really what we did it's a it's federal dollars available. Um, the focus of this pot of money was primarily not roads not on the state system. So we looked at a lot of the intersections where we have a lot of left turn crashes that could potentially be mitigated by uh, some type of left turn protection. So we're seeing more and more of the flashing yellow arrows, love them or hate them. They, they do have a proven safety benefit to them. So that was a big part of what this grant will do is to allow us to install a handful more flashing yellow arrows. It'll also install back plates on some of the signal, head, signal heads to help make them more visible. A lot of times sun glare can be a contributing factor in some of those crashes when the signal head is washed out with the sun. And adding that back plate around it just helps to to maybe shield some of the sun so you have a better chance of seeing that with your eye to catch the signal head. And it doesn't sound like a big cost item, but add it all up, it's going to be a, a I think Jim mentioned before, it's an 800 and some thousand dollar grant from CDOT. We have a component of match. It's total projects a little under a million dollars. But we also have to replace a few signal poles to be able to get the distance we need to get the left turn arrow in the right place. So combination of New signals, a couple locations need new cabinets, new poles, and some wiring. So it um, it all adds up in the end. But yeah, pretty good to be able to get some dollars for it and hopefully see some benefits from it. So real quick, I'll 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 carry on talking about uh, about some signals. So I, I threw out some miles of road in the city. I threw out miles of sidewalk. It's also important to note we have 97 traffic signals in the city of Longmont. Um, after next week, we'll have 98, and then later on in the fall, we'll have 99 because um, we have two signals under construction. Uh, we've got 68 school flashers, um, two pedestrian flashers, four fire station flashers, 49 radar signs. Um, on our signals, we've got five PTZ cameras. That's uh, pan tilt zoom. Um, it enables us to to monitor traffic uh, at several of the higher higher uh, traveled intersections. Uh, so you, you throw this all together, and and it starts to 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 add up in terms of kind of the maintenance needs. Um, so you know, I love I love capital. Everyone thinks capital. He thinks improvements. Thinks what we're going to do to you know widen a road, build a bridge. Uh, that's the, the the fun stuff. Uh, the grind is the maintenance, but that's what keeps your your residents moving, uh, whether it be through cars, bikes, uh, pedestrians, keeps them safe. Um, sometimes you can you can make an argument this is more important sometimes than um, widening roadway because this this is what people expect from TAB and from council and from city staff. Uh, a, a sound infrastructure so that they can get from point A to point B um, without, uh, you know, sometimes stopping at a red light. And I'm sure Tyler's heard that any number of times. He said they've hit too many red lights. So um, one other thing to add on our our uh, our traffic signals, um, I think a good portion of them are on uh, about 55 of them are on a um, intelligence system that communicates with it and can move traffic faster. Uh, areas like over, over, over um, 119 Street, they are all okay. So, so yeah, we all of our signals are all connected. We can control them all um, remotely from our um, from our desks. Basically, the part I think Jim was talking about was adaptive. So all there along, you go. All along Hover, Ken Pratt, and Main Street, all those signals are, signals are running what we call adaptive control. So they don't have a fixed timing plan like a traditional signal, but they're more adjusting to, to real time demand of traffic. All right. So next slide. So one of the other projects we're, we're have been working on um, 
is the TRP 92, which is a Boston Avenue connection, which will get a, a new crossing um, at the east end of Boston Avenue down by um, kind of down off of Price Road uh, will connect into uh, across uh, the tracks. Um, new East West Collect Collector um, ties in for the BRT connection for the future First and Main Street project. Uh, currently, we're we're undertaking some conceptual design this year, going to final design next year for construction the following year. Um, coordinating with BNSF uh, and PUC, and it is coordinated with the Quiet Zone project. Uh, BNSF requires that for every crossing uh, that they will approve, the city has to or the municipal agency has to close two other crossings. So it's coordinating with with our railroad quiet zones and that we're closing um, several crossings there uh, to create quiet zones and also to help us get this crossing. Uh, so we have some conceptual design currently and we're working on some property acquisition now. So uh, it is a pretty, pretty interesting project. And I think if I can, Jim, don't mean to steal it over here, but in terms of the importance of this project and some of the things to consider with this one, this ties in ultimately to the um, the first and main transit station that's going down uh, southwest corner of first and main, and this is the preferred route for that BRT. I say, we talk, Phil talked about acronyms earlier, so I'll try and explain them as I can. Bus rapid transit is working with RTD to get a faster bus service here to Walmart. And this was their preferred route was coming down Boston to make this connection to get right in to that transit station of 1st and Main. So it is an important collector connection for the city also has implications on the future bus system as we talk about this one. That brings us to quiet zones. Um, in the last few years, council uh, has heard a lot from our residents. Um, they initiated uh, a program wherein um, we had undertaken a study and they approved uh, some funding in the budget to undertake some design, get started in construction, and then um, to leverage our dollars, uh, the city went out and, and was able to obtain a grant from the Federal Railroad Administration uh, to make this project more viable. It is an $8 million project. Um, we got a $4 million grant. Uh, currently, design is underway. It will uh, create quiet zones at 16 um, intersections throughout the city, and a quiet zone could include closing a crossing. Uh, so we are working towards getting uh, to construction. Uh, originally committed to have construction going on at the tail end of this year. Uh, but that pesky grant got in the way, and when someone wants to give you $4 million, you want to make sure you you get everything right. So we're looking at construction in early 2021 to include uh, and start at the 3rd Avenue crossing. I uh, have been working with BNSF. Um, uh, we're working with the PUC, and currently uh, we are finalizing the FRA grant agreement and should be bringing that in front of council in September or October for their consideration. And if you have, uh, if Tyler wants to add anything. I think one thing that I would say about this and, and early on, that's what can this board do? I think this is a good example of it, here was something that the TAB over the years, previous boards really took, took up as an issue and really made this one of their priorities. And I think we're seeing the results of that from them being persistent and pursuing an issue that Hey, this has made it to the top of the priority list and we're able to, to get it done and move it forward. So exciting seeing how the TV was able to influence that and exciting on a personal level to, to be able to get this done. I think it's a great project for Longmont. I uh, see Joe's question here, what constitutes a quiet zone? Uh, good, good question. So quiet zone is sort of misleading that it's not a silent zone. We're simply looking to eliminate the train horn. So there's still the noise. Trains by themselves are noisy. They're big, large metal vehicles that absolutely make a lot of noise. What we're trying to do is implement safety measures so they don't have to blow those sound the horns at each crossing. Typically, what those treatments are are going to be some type of gates, medians, flashers. A handful of treatments are required at each. 
crossing to replace the safety lost by blowing the horn. In the eyes of the FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, BNSF, the horn is the most effective safety device possible. It's very loud, as we all know. We can probably hear it through the extensive town. It's instant feedback. It's easy for the operator to know, confirm that it's working. So failure rate is, is pretty minimal. So that's why, that's what a quiet zone is. If you have any more questions, happy to, to talk with you more about that. Okay, so next project, TRP 118, uh, that is the Boston Avenue Bridge uh, over the St. Ferrain. Um, both the graphic uh, below and the photo to the to the right is the view kind of from the trail or from the creek looking um, looking west. So um, this project uh, design is currently underway. Um, construction to begin later this year or early 2021. Uh, this project is critically important because it will it'll expand primarily the uh, the channel out, uh, widen the bridge, lengthen the bridge so it'll pass the 100 year 100 year flood. Uh, but it also serves as a financial match for the Army Corps of Engineers project, um, which is upstream of, of, of this, this structure. Um, it will provide improved flood protection for the area and enhance the pet and bike improvements as well. Um, and then if we want to jump over to the next slide. So I wanted to also throw in, um, we, we throw in about $30,000 a year for DRN. Uh, 31 resilient St. Ferrain project from the street fund. And um, so kind of why is, is that important? Why is it in a transportation uh, update? Well, part of that project, um, we're finishing one of the last bridges um, previous uh, in the graphic you see in front of you uh, uh, from kind of the right going left, uh, city reach one and two a um, those portions in, in, in the kind of the yellow and in the red are complete. City Reach 2B is under construction. That includes the crossing of the BNSF Railroad Bridge over the creek. Um, we're starting an Isaac Walton design is underway. Uh, phase two is the Army Corps. Tomorrow night, they are, we are taking an agreement in front of council for their consideration. Uh, that has a partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers for them to um, design that one reach and then actually constructed as well. Um, so our, uh, they never do anything for free. So part of our match, it's $15 million project, <clears throat> is that uh, Boston Avenue Bridge project. Um, what's important with that is that they are actually doing all the work um, for the design and construction. And it's not being, they're not just handing us a check for the, the, the work, they're actually going to do it. it takes a load off of, of staff. Um, and we can continue moving um, the project forward. Uh, the Hover Reach uh, to the west is still um, kind of in the evaluation stage, although we are currently doing a cost benefit analysis so that we can apply for a grant this fall, which hopefully will, will get us working towards the next phase. So back to my original statement is why is this important? Um, well, Resilient St. Ferrain also does have a trail along it, which is part of what the $30,000 helps with, uh, but it's also important that we replace several bridges. So when you have a waterway flowing through your city and that is subject to flooding, nothing will wreck your transportation system like a flood. So if you're not prepared and your bridges aren't, uh, can't carry that 100 year storm when it occurs and it will occur again, uh, we will be able to weather it in a resilient, safe manner and keep our transportation system uh, keep our emergency vehicles moving, keep our pedestrians, keep our, our traffic moving through through our town. Uh, so that's kind of the importance and why why it was included in the in this presentation. So some of the challenges um, and, and there you can add to this list. I'm sure there's there's many more. Um, one of the some of the things we want to note is uh, with our street fund with our transportation network and with our, our, our TCIF is we, we constantly see changing public needs for transportation. Uh, we were driving earlier this year towards pushing more people into buses. 
um, working on a train system, and then the COVID-19 hit. And that chased everybody away out of public transportation for the short term. So we have to get back to that because um, that will take take a lot of the stress off of, of our, our transportation grid and our network of getting people out of cars, into buses, onto bikes. Um, one of the other challenges is the funding of the local transit service. Okay, increasing costs. Um, are, um, we see ride free going up. We see the via service. They are constantly asking for for more dollars. Flexbus has increasing costs as well. So those, that's that's the funding challenge. Um, quality of life challenges. Um, whether it's traffic mitigation, um, congestion management throughout our city, um, climate change will will add a, a component of that. Uh, changing dynamics of, again, going back to the first one, moving people out of cars, what's that going to look like for our, our, our changing transportation system? Um, believe it or not, the street system is still growing. Uh, there is development coming in throughout the city uh, that will add to that, that they will build certain roads for their, uh, so that they can, you know, build homes, then turn them over to the city. That is part of our growing system. We're not really... City's really not building new roads, but developers are. Um, our roads are aging. Okay, um, part of that uh, TRP one is is kind of addresses that. But as those roads age, we have to provide um, a good quality product for our residents, um, so that they can get to their work, to their to play, to to and from uh, wherever they can under COVID, which are some of the impacts. The biggest impact to COVID will be to our budget. Uh, it isn't just the short term we saw um, in a downturn in the sales and use tax. Uh, we have projected that our revenues into next year while our economy recovers have de will decrease. So our, we're already looking ahead for future years that we're gonna lose about $3 million worth of revenue out of the street fund. Um, if that doesn't come into play, then we may have an opportunity to take on some projects that are, in, on, that are currently unfunded. Uh, we won't know that until partway through the year. Right now, we project our revenues. We've, we anticipate a decrease in those. So we've adjusted accordingly uh, with this capital um, improvement program for the next five years. So one of the other, the last challenges that I didn't list here, go back, is the slide to the right. Go back, come on. You don't have questions, is the, the intersection of Hover and 119. So the challenge we will face is that we went with, partnered with Boulder County, uh, CDOT, and put in a, a grant for a $26 million project. So in the coming months, we should hear whether we get that project or not. Uh, and if the grant is approved, then we have to figure out how to, how to move that project forward. So Phil, any questions? You applied for the grant, it's all your fault. <laughs> so with that, um, I can open it up to questions. Um, and then the last slide after questions goes back into the options for recommendations. All right, thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate that. Any clarifying questions or uh, comments from any of the transportation advisory board members? I have a question. Go for it, David. Uh, so thanks, Jim, for the overall uh, look. Uh, briefly, can you tell us what projects we've reduced funding on because of the expected reduction in revenues? Ooh, I'd have to work up that list. Um, we took out, um, we had um, some missing sidewalks as a project, some component, uh, components of that. We took that out. We also took out EMUX in the next year. We reduced our TRP1. Um, we also reduced... Um, What's an EMUX? I'm sorry, EMUX. Enhanced <laughs> multi-use corridor. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. <laughs> so um, we, we didn't have a lot of money dedicated to EMUX next year, uh, but we, we, we took that out. We took our missing sidewalks out. We cut down TSM, the Transportation System Management, um, so in future years, two years out, we probably wouldn't be planning for any traffic signals. Um, 
we used, like I said, some of the paving dollars. Uh, we pushed out a couple of projects. Um, as opposed to doing them, we delayed them rather than cutting them out. Thank you. Great. And Jim, by the way, there was a question that Jacques uh, listed in the uh, uh, the chat section there. Um, do you see that there? Or do you want Jacques to uh, uh, recap it? Is that the TRP appears to show an increased gap in funding versus need over the next five years? Any plans to close that gap? That that'll just depend on what what we do with funding. So we could we can look at. No one likes to hear about it um, into next year as we we prep for the future years. We can talk about a rate increase. Um, that is in this atmosphere currently with COVID nineteen, people out of work. That would not be anything I would recommend. Um, I think we have to get past that, get an economy back to normal, get people's lives back to normal before we we, we could look for that. One way to to offset um, the gaps is to constantly be pursuing grant opportunities that we can, if we have fund projects on the books that we can move forward on, if we get a grant for them, that can free up city dollars that can be shifted over to um, other, other areas. Thank you. That, that, that answers my question. And I just want to congratulate you on working with the Army Corps of Engineers. That's a great way to leverage other resources. And it, I kind of get the feeling when I look in the next couple of years, you know, kind of our base need, the number of miles of roadways, the maintenance costs, the traffic signals, that base level looks like it's increasing. And it, I don't know, I could be wrong, but it just looks like we might have some slimmer choices on new development as we take care of our existing assets. Is that pretty accurate? Yes. Okay. Good work. This is great. Great. Any other clarifying questions or comments? Yes, Sandy. So we're going to be making a recommendation to city council. Is it based on what you are you just showed us, or is it based on the twenty-five different um, projects that we were sent by? Um, Tyler, Tyler said in our packet. I'll have to ask Tyler what 25, 25 projects, um, but we're, we're focusing on the, the next year's CIP is what we presented tonight, the, the critical components. The, the fund state and the 20, um, 21 to 25 CIP program covers a number of projects several years out. So we're looking at basically this next year. Um, because in two years, if we get additional funding, the 20, 2022 CIP pro projects will look, may look totally different. Just clarification of the projects that were included in the packet. Those are all of the active transportation CIPs, all the CIPs that have street fund dollars going into them is what's included in the packet. It's a combination of funded, partially funded, and unfunded projects that you'll see the sheets for. So th there's definitely some in there that are unfunded. Clearly, we don't have the money to do those right now. The funded ones, I think, funded and partially funded ones are the the ones we're really looking at right now. I think unless there was something that TAB had questions or concerns about, we could look at the other ones. Tyler, actually, before you get on, or, or Jim for that, uh, I guess probably better for, for Jim. Uh, quick clarifying question. Are there existing grants that you think are, you know, similar to the 119 uh, Hover interchange that significantly shift our activities? Are there any other major pending grants that you think we have um, a, a, a decent chance that that could have a, a probable chance of, of shifting our our, our list here. The only the grant I think currently um, that will maybe may adjust 
some of the dollars here there would be the sunset um, project that I think Phil's looking at a grant now for that. Um, that is a project currently that that we had in our our budget um, under TSM um, earlier in the year. We kind of took it out, put it on hold for now. But knowing that there's a grant available, we've been able to to, to look at ramping it back up. Um, and and sometimes grants are are are, are challenging in that you know uh, they always they usually always require a match. Uh, it just depends on what it is. But they're also they they're they're limited. Um, like CDOT, in this case, CDOT has dollars um, for use for grants. Unfortunately, it has to be kind of tied to uh, uh, the CDOT roadway system. So in this case, we, we've been working on Sunset. Um, that was a road diet we finished last year. Uh, that kind of fell into it that that's the only project that kind of applies. Um, you know, right. you've got other, you know, and, and what you also have to look at is is in future years, and with this, with the budget noted in the fund statement is we've got a lot of things going on. Okay, even though there's there's a kind of a, a, uh, a what we anticipate a downturn in the economy um, in next year, you know, in that intergovernmental item um, in that fund statement, we got $12 million coming in. Okay, and the reason for that is we're going to be doing Kaufman Street improvement. So that's a $6.8 million grant. Um, we're working on 66 under grant dollars now. Um, so there, there's, there's a, um, you know, you throw in the RSVP stuff where we're, we're constantly trying to leverage our dollars. Uh, you know, RSVP is kind of a, a really good success story because we're taking on what is basically over a hundred million dollar project right now. We've, we've spent about, I believe we've invested about 85 and over half of that is with federal, whether it's army Corps, whether it's FEMA, whether it's HUD. You know the cities, city residents have only had to pony up through through bond sales. Um, you know, I think about forty percent of that. So excellent. And, and just to we're clear, trying, we're trying to constantly, constantly trying to leverage our existing city dollars. We're trying to be responsible stewards of the limited resources that we have. Um, so uh, it is constantly a challenge. Thanks. Yeah. And just to clarify, RSVP. I assume that's Resilient Saint Vrain Project. That is a resilient again. Like EMUX, it is an acronym. Sorry, it is the Resilient Safe Rain Project. So, uh, great. All right. I know we have a still have a full agenda. Any additional clarifying questions before we uh, uh, seek a motion? And we can always, if you have questions after the fact, we're always here. Um, email, it's always best, or call us. We will certainly be able to provide you more information should you. Um, and then the full budget will be going in front of council um, for in, in September. Uh, for their consideration. Um, that, that includes the CIP. So, Joan, I'll be seeing you again in a few weeks when I do the whole CIP uh, with everything, including what some of these slides you'll see a repeat. Great. Well, I think there was uh, uh, what Jim presented. Um, uh, the main questions are ultimately uh, do we seek to be able to provide the transportation advisory boards? Uh, endorsement recommending uh, in, in support of uh, uh, the staff recommend uh, capital improvement uh, projects, um, or um, is there a compelling need to be able to make any amendments there? Is there a motion that anybody would like to entertain? Sandy? I so move that we accept uh, the plan that uh, Jim just proposed to us this evening to the city council. Great. So a motion. Uh, great. So just to clarify, uh, uh, Sandy, uh, um, uh, so you're making a motion to be able to uh, support the uh, the staff recommendations for the capital improvement programs as presented. Correct. Great. As presented. I, yes. Great. And I second. Uh, who was that? Yes, right, Jacques. Jacques. I second. Great. Any discussion? You wanted to add a comment on that? I I do. Can you put the options back on the screen? Yeah, I just had a um, if if Jim could explain that second option, what that last part was, just for so everybody understands it. I don't understand it.
So the, the, the basis the only difference between the two options is in the language um, in the in the second option has the, the proposed capital improvement program with revisions recommended from the transportation advisory board. Okay, thanks so, for explaining that. Great. And uh, Jim, if you can put it back to uh, um, uh, the, the, the view before, just so we can see everyone's votes more easily instead of a little strip on the top of the screen here. I think Tyler's driving. There okay. we go. Thank you, Tyler. Great. So we have a motion uh, uh, to support the, the staff recommendations um, for the capital improvement program. We have a second. Um, at this point, are there any additional comments for discussion? Okay, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. 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 All right, I think that makes everyone there. Anybody opposed? Any abstaining? All right, well done, Jim. The motion carries. Thank you all. All right, well, I think, uh, you know, far be it from us to not want to make sure that we're thinking about capital improvement programs looking forward, but without looking back here. Looks like there's some updates um, going to 2019 capital improvement program. So, uh, Tom, Micah, and Tyler, you're up. Neil, I think there's a chance you may have an older agenda in front of you. Okay. Well, then <laughs> we'll uh, disregard that one. Um. Next thing we had on here, info items, was a work plan update, if that's what. Perfect. Perfect. I just pulled the link there, so uh, forgive me for uh, uh, the outcome information. All right. Work plan. So the, each year, um, each year, January, we usually sit down and meet and talk about the, the upcoming year's work plan. As we've got two new board members, new chair and vice chair, good opportunity just to, to put this in front of you to see some of the things we're working on, we've worked on, and a good opportunity if there's things on here that you want to make any minor adjustments to uh, understand that this year has been a little different than normal years. COVID's definitely had an impact on the meetings we've had. We've really gotten direction from our city manager to, to, to minimize these meetings if there's no real action items. So as we've tried to condense and really make the best use of your time to, to really bring items to you that we need an action on. Um, that said, I'll give you an opportunity if you've seen this or want to talk about it, if you want to make any comments, um, happy to talk about that. Otherwise, the, the information's there if you want to look at it and see kind of where we're going to the end of the year. Neil, I think one of the things that you wanted to talk about was traffic mitigation. So. It's still on there still. We'll still have a, another sessions dedicated to that to talk about that and maybe some potential updates to that program. Um, anything else? I think re really this this is one of the bigger one of the bigger things that this group does every year is, is the recommendation on CIP. It's a pretty important program that the service that the city provides. So appreciate you guys' feedback on that as well. With that, if there's no questions, we can move on to the next item. If you have questions, feel free to ask. I said a quick one, Tyler, and it's not so much of an addition. It's more of just kind of echoing the the RTD. I've heard now a couple of times that our transportation buses around town. I think we really are going to have to look at that over the next twelve months. Um, I keep hearing about flex ride costs going up. We have the ride free Longmont costs are going up. Um, so I see it's on here, and I'm just kind of echoing that. That's that's. I think that's going to be a good one for us to really dig into and try to figure out. Well said. Jacques, uh, uh, I just clarify: is that uh, related to uh, proposed changes to the work plan, or just clarification that when we have the discussion, it's important to do our due diligence? And you kind of to put a put a star to that one on the work plan. Great. Um, and I'm, so I'm just, my comment is more on just yeah, I, I'm just hearing more and more importance on that, and I'm glad to see it on there. 
Great. All right, any other comments or clarifications on the work plan? All right, do we uh, do we need a motion for the uh, to approve the work plan for uh, uh, the coming year? I, I'm not looking for a motion at this point. We didn't. We took the motions at, in January that we approved the work plan, and it was either January, or February meeting. I think now it's definitely in light of all the changes we've had. There's probably an opportunity to to make changes if we need to, but not necessarily need a, a motion to to revamp this thing here. All right, Tyler, let's uh, keep marching forward to the range passenger uh, uh, rail activity. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yep. I'm just going to introduce, I'm going to quickly introduce Spencer. Yep, go ahead, Phil. Sorry. 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 Uh, so next on your agenda is the uh, range passenger rail. Um, um, front range passenger rail service program, and they're, they're they've got a interesting. Uh, this is kind of an interesting interesting program that really shows how we can possibly do passenger rail in the future. And so, we're going to turn it over to uh, Spencer, and I see Randy Grauberger is on the phone as well. So, uh, both of those gentlemen have been working on this for a number of years, and I'll turn it over to Spencer to talk more about kind of what's going on with this and uh, kind of the promise that it holds for the future. Bear, bear with me for a sec. I'm getting your slideshow loaded up. Sounds good. Um, in the meantime, uh, Phil mentioned uh, my name is Spencer Dodge. I'm the liaison with the Southwest. Um, it's a legislatively created entity um, a few years back. Uh, Randy, I think Randy Grauberger is on the phone as well. Randy, if you're there, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm Randy Grauberger. I'm the project director for the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. And we'd just like to thank you folks for uh, giving us an opportunity tonight to uh, give you all an update on what's going on with the Front Range Passenger Rail Project. Uh, there we go. Um, great, so we'll go ahead and um, dive in. We've done many of these presentations uh, up and down the front range over the last uh, year and a half or so. You may have seen this information, um, some may have not. Uh, on this slide, you can see kind of commissioners that make up um, our body. Um, one key note here, uh, a change over the last few months is the addition of DJ Mitchell. Um, he is the passenger, or I'm sorry, the vice president of passenger rail operations for BNSF Railway. Um, he just came on board oh, about five weeks ago. Um, these are some of the other members of the commission. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the Southwest Chief and Front Range Passenger Rail Commission uh, is kind of a two-pronged mission. Um, starting off, this was originally the Southwest Chief uh, Commission full stop. Um, and that work was to preserve Amtrak Southwest Chief Service uh, across Southeast Colorado down uh, Trinidad, La Junta. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, the legislature did add the um, minor task of facilitating the development of front range passenger rail service as well. So, um, going to have two missions there. Uh, the uh, vision that has been developed uh, over the last several months with the help of stakeholders up and down the front range um, is uh, seen here. Um, so, really developing passenger rail service that serves front range communities, um, Pueblo to Fort Collins. Uh, is a critical component of Colorado's future, um, providing a safe, efficient, and reliable transportation option for travel between major population centers along the front range and create a backbone for connecting and expanding rail and transit options in the state and region. So a little bit more uh, complex than just commuter rail, a um, little bit more strung out along this 180 mile corridor. <laughs> Throughout the project, um, we're keeping close tabs on the federal agencies and in coordinating with its federal agencies. Uh, we don't have a lead agency um, identified yet, um, quite simply, because we don't quite know where the alignment's gonna be. Um, so we're working really closely with Federal Railroad Administration, um, Federal Transit Administration, and the Federal Highway Administration. Um, we've had three different calls with those, most recently in April 2nd, beginning of April. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we also received a Chrissy grant um, that we applied for back in October of 2019. Um, 
<clears throat> you see here, this is the Southwest Chief Through Car Service to Colorado Springs Feasibility Study. Um, you might say, well, why am I telling you about a Southwest Chief? Uh, you guys are up there in Longmont. Um, but this is kind of, we view this as uh, a potential um, kind of first uh, first leg, first usable option um, for Front Range Passenger Rail. Uh, so I'm partnering with CDOT and Pueblo County and La Junta and, and Colorail, the Colorado Passenger uh, Rail Passenger Association. We successfully applied and received a $225,000 Chrissy grant. And this will look at um, some of the different al uh, alignments and, and operating procedures uh, for that Southwest Chief through car service. Next slide. Thank you. Um, well, you guys actually, I'm outlining this with my mouse, um, but you can't see my screen. Uh, in that bottom southeastern uh, corner of Colorado, yes, down there, um, that solid line is the current uh, alignment of the Southwest Chief. Um, that dotted line is the potential uh, rerouted or um, through car service on that Southwest Chief. That's what that Chrissy Grant is going to um, look at. The big solid blue line, that corridor that we're looking at specifically for front range passenger rail. Um, it's a really thick line currently. Uh, we don't really know where uh, the, exactly the alignment is going to be, so we don't um, we don't want to be too prescriptive. So just to give you kind of a visual of the of the corridor um, north to south that we're talking about here. Next slide. I feel like I'm moving quickly, so if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt me. It won't hurt my feelings one bit. <clears throat> Mentioned earlier that we've been working with stakeholders uh, from Fort Collins. Yes, correct. Chrissy does stand for Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvements. Um, that 2019 grant um, is not specifically an improvement, but there is a track in there that provides for uh, planning studies and um, operation studies. So that's the kind of big same pot of money that that comes from. Good question. Uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, you know, with the 180 mile uh, corridor, there's um, there's a lot of context, um, different communities, different problems to solve. Uh, so we didn't think it prudent to kind of have that same conversation all at once every single time. Um, so we broke this up into uh, three different segments, north, central and south. This is really to provide project information and obtain feedback at a local level. Um, so you're looking at regional and local stakeholders here. Uh, we have our next round of those, um, mid-September 15th through the 17th. I think we're going to start, Randy, correct me, um, that Tuesday should be the north, um, and then Wednesday should be the central. And Longmont's in a, a particularly interesting location. Some of your context uh, relates closely with Boulder um, and RTD in the north line, and then also with uh, um, Fort Collins and getting back and forth between Fort Collins. So that's kind of you guys are sliding in kind of in both uh, north and central sometimes. Um, but so keeping in mind that it is a 108 mile quarter, um, it's important that we do have quarter wide conversations. Um, and so we also have been holding quarter stakeholder quarter wide. We held one of the uh, late December or I'm sorry, early December late last year. Um, and we're going to hold another one in early fall this year. And this is really uh, to kind of look at stakeholder based recommendations for uh, cohesive and quarter-wide project decisions. Those kind of big overarching questions. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, so in the in this planning process, uh, there's many, many, many steps. Uh, and we just recently wrapped up kind of the first level one evaluation in this initial alternatives analysis, uh, moving it into level two. Uh, so level one was really, uh, what are the possibilities? Um, what can we do? What are the, what are the options? Um, once we look at those, we kind of weeded some of those with fatal flaws um, and impossibilities out and uh, have moved into level two evaluations. And how do these have, uh, alternatives um, compare to each other? And then after that, we'll uh, issue a notice of intent um, and advance to NEPA. Uh, next slide. And I can talk, I think the next slide will be yes, uh, on that level one evaluation. Um, so we started by reviewing a lot of the existing uh, studies of existing freight rail and highway rights of way. Um, you know, we really wanted to make sure that we weren't reinventing the wheel. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of work, a lot of homework done um, over the last few decades, uh, looking at front range passenger rail in many different ways. Uh, so we didn't want to ignore all that work. Um, so we kind of took all of that and made sure we're uh, considering all of the previous great work that's been done. So in those quarters, looking at the freight rail quarters, uh, Union Pacific and BNSF Railway, um, you guys are intimately familiar with as well as some of the highway corridors along I-25, um, E-470 around Denver, and uh, US-85 as well. 
So the engineering done uh, was to often optimize alignments to improve speeds or minimize impacts in, uh, throughout the level two evaluation. So we already have that work done. Um, that work is, uh, I think, all the way done, um, completed at this point, uh, as we are in level two. Um, and the goal is really to understand how the existing freight rail and highway horizontal and vertical geometries, um, physical locations and right of way availabilities, availabilities can interact with or support um, adjacent passenger rail systems. We also looked at quarter travel times, uh, broadly estimating those uh, giving existing and future uh, populations. <laughs> so some of the corridors that we looked at, uh, there's two in the south uh, that be along I-25 in the I-25 right of ways, as well as in that BNSF freight corridor. Um, there are two in the north segment, uh, the BNSF corridor as well, um, and then again, the I-25 uh, highway rights of way. And then there's four separate ones in the central segment. Um, that, can, uh, that includes the E-470 route you know, going around Denver, uh, I-25, um, the freight corridors, and Randy, help me out. I'm blanking on the fourth one. I have it written down here. The fourth one was the uh, basically the alignment that was evaluated during the North I-25 commuter rail update back in 2015. Yeah. So, again, um, playing on some of the homework that's already been done in the state of Colorado. Uh, and really, we uh, our engineers work to optimize and refine these, um, looking at geometric refinements such as uh, you know smoothing out some of those curves along uh, along the south. Um, a lot of that was vertical as well, uh, less so in the north segment. Um, I think, although when you get up to the Big Thompson Canyon, there's a, a river. There's there's some of that work as well. Um, but really, wanting to understand the highest activity station areas, um, you know, where the, where are these big usage stations going to be, um, and how can we connect those to to give us the the best ridership and the best service along the front range? So these next few slides, um, these are uh, I don't think that we can uh, overstate these enough. These come from Amtrak. Uh, Amtrak has proposed a capital uh, capital grant program. Um, which could really help to fund the, the initial front range passenger rail service. Uh, so what they're proposing is um, investing $2.3 billion um, of Amtrak money, of federal money, uh, structure. Uh, and then over the course of the first five years of that operation, um, slowly 20% each year, shifting that towards a state supported service. Um, so this looks like, uh, you know, really connecting Fort Collins, Boulder, Denver, Colorado Springs with some of those intermediate stops in between. Um, and really kind of providing a big injection of capital funding um, to, to get us going here. On this next slide, I think the next slide is the, uh, uh, yes, so again, this is another map. Um, you can see some of these intermediate stations, Loveland, uh, Longmont, um, Littleton, Castle Rock, uh, the Air Force Academy, uh, guys, Longmont is indeed on there. And you'll notice, uh, many of you will, that that alignment certainly does look a lot like the RTD uh, line that um, has been in the works for, well, maybe since before I was born. I'm not quite sure on the exact date. Um, but again, this is kind of the alignment we're looking at. This is what we've been focusing on um, as well. And then the next slide is just kind of a, a very 2005, ah, not quite since before I was born, <laughs> not that young. Um, and so you can see this is kind of an initial, just for, uh, <laughs> for uh, example purposes, um, uh, just kind of the timetable, and I have a question, and I'll exam and I'll uh, I'll address that real quickly. Um, but for example, this is what they're kind of proposing as as the operating service. Um, you know, a couple trains southbound, and then a couple trains northbound as well uh, per day. Um, when do you expect to find out if you may be likely to get an Amtrak grant? So that grant um, is contingent upon the appropriations uh, bill for fiscal year 21. Um, it was passed in the House and it's sitting in the Senate now waiting, uh, waiting, <laughs> waiting on a conversation around that. Um, we're not sure, uh, we really don't know. Hopefully that, that gets passed before uh, no, the November election, um, certainly before we get to uh, too deep into the 20 um, or even um, budget needing to be done. So we're not sure at this point. Um, we do know that September 30th, uh, yes. So uh, what's that? Five, six, seven weeks now, I think. Um, there's some other uh, other bills um, you may have heard that the Senate are, are, uh, are looking at right now and trying to get passed. So um, they'll have to get to it eventually. Um, but I, I just don't know if we're going to be in there. Um, or not. We do know uh, that Amtrak has singled out uh, the Front Range Passenger Rail Corridor, 
the, what is it, uh, Nashville to Atlanta, I think the Virginia Triangle, and then the Texas uh, line as um, those are their four priorities right now. They really want to focus their capital money on that as far as the national network goes. Um, so we are a priority for Amtrak. Uh, they've talked with us um, many, many times. Randy and I had to sit on this information for several months and it was very, very difficult. Um, but yes, we can uh, we can let the folks know now that Amtrak really wants to focus on these medium range corridors, um, front range passions rail uh, being one of those priorities. Puts us in a good position, um, given that we're already along the process of, of planning out um, both capital and operating uh, kind of where we want front range passenger rail to go, uh, kind of jumping ahead of that. Next slide, please. And uh, want to leave you off uh, with um, a bit of stakeholder engagement information. Uh, many of you have seen these numbers. Uh, we have, um, these were both, both of these surveys done last year. Uh, the online Metro Quest was an opt-in. Uh, we had uh, close to 7,000 um, respondents uh, and really, really strong positive numbers. You know, 95% of respondents believe passenger rail service could help address transportation needs. 92% uh, would be interested in using the service if it were available. Uh, I think it's remarkable. This was an opt-in um, survey. So, you know, we might've been preaching to the choir a little bit, um, but even so, getting 92% agreement and 95% agreement among almost 7,000 people, uh, I don't care what the question is. It's, it's going to be really hard to do that no, um, no matter what. So we, uh, we recognized that was an opt-in um, and not so scientifically valid. Uh, so then we commissioned a scientifically valid survey, uh, 600 responses. Uh, these are all likely voters. Um, and what we really were interested in was, you know, what's the ballot appetite for this? So we asked very general broad questions, um, you know, uh, would you support a front range passenger rail service project that would have regularly scheduled train service to major population centers for Collins and Pueblo? 81% supported that, only 12% um, opposed that to a certain degree. And then we asked kind of the big question, everybody says, oh, well, you know, how are you going to pay for this? Did you ask about sales tax? So we asked, generally speaking, um, would you support or oppose a sales tax increase to fund a front range passenger rail service, regularly scheduled train service between Fort Collins and Pueblo with an estimated cost of $5 billion? Now this $5 billion number, uh, it's, it's a very, very, very high level estimate that we really only use for purposes of asking a question. Um, and so that was about 61% total support, uh, which was really key. Um, you know, our, uh, pollsters there, uh, they, they never, nobody's really ever polled these kind of ballot questions for a front range passenger rail service. Um, and given at the time, the lack of uh, publicity and marketing and, and stakeholder engagement we had done, they were shocked. They couldn't believe that we had such high um, support. <laughs> I do see a question there. Uh, is there data regarding uh, forecast passenger volume? Uh, that's one of, the, one of the efforts that we're undertaking right now um, through this survey. Uh, survey. We should have, um, certainly by the end of this year, I hope, um, should have some of those initial uh, um, ridership modeling numbers, um, but, but we'll get that soon. Don't have it yet. And I think that is probably the last slide I have. Um, <clears throat> yes, so again, uh, Randy is our project director down there. If you have any questions, email him or myself. We do have a um, front range passenger rail specific uh, website. Um, you can get all kinds of information there, a little more detail on the things um, that I've talked about tonight. Uh, Randy, I think I heard you in there. Did you want to leave any other final comments, thoughts? No, again, just uh, thanks to all of you and Longmont. I know you and, and Phil Greenwald especially has been a champion for your community about this project. Uh, I was involved in the North I-25 commuter rail update back in 2015. Uh, I was the project manager for the consultant team at that time, and that's when I got a chance to know Phil pretty well. And and now, uh, as in my new role as project director for the commission, it continues to be a real pleasure working with Phil and, and the other folks in the Longmont area. So don't be shy. Continue to uh, give us opportunities to provide updates uh, to this group or others within the Longmont area. Uh, or that's that's what they pay Spencer and I to do. So uh, please. Please uh, don't be shy, and, and again, thank you for the opportunity. And if you got any more questions, unless unless you need to uh, move on with your agenda, Spencer and I are, are here to answer some more questions if you have anything. Great, we have time for one or two questions there if uh, there's something top of mind here. 
Yes, Council Member Peck. Oh, you're on mute there. Thank you, Tyler. Um, I just wanted to know, and I put it in the chat, if we can get a copy of the slideshow from Randy or... Uh... Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Randy. Okay, make that available to you. Okay. I've, got it. I've got it, and I can send it out right now. Fantastic. Thank you. Easy enough. Any last questions? Yes, Sandy. I'm just curious, uh, do you have any idea what it would cost to go from Longmont down to, let's say, Denver? As far as uh, cost and actual ticket price or cost yes. to build? Yes. I, well, both, but no, <laughs> a ticket price, ticket price. Uh, you know, in the next kind of phase of planning, um, right now we're doing a very general, uh, we need to just figure out where we're going to put this and, and how we're going to run this. Um, but then we're going to move into the uh, kind of those very, very specific operating questions. You know, how much is this going to cost? What's the ticketing structure going to look like? Um, and what's the fare structure going to be uh, going to look like? So I don't have that number for you okay. quite yet, um, but that's kind of in that next stage of, of planning. Okay. Are you going to be able to use any of the existing rails? that um let's see that burlington northern the freight rails or you're gonna have to build additional rails to run this uh train um yes and no i, I think it depends geographically where you're looking at um in certain places uh you know the only option might be to uh to run on the same freight lines um in other areas where there's a little more space uh, we might be able to build um kind of a third track to to focus just on from range passenger rail. So I know that's not a very specific answer either, but it's kind of all of the above. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Randy and I'll, I'll jump in right there too. Uh, again, we uh, are very fortunate to have both BNSF and UP as members of this commission. And we've had three really good sit down meetings with just the project team and, and the class one railroads, the latest being just last Wednesday. And again, both class ones are very cooperative and and uh, I think by us bringing them into this project early, uh, they are they are committed to trying to find a way to make front range passenger rail a reality. So uh, we're very fortunate in that regard. I know BNSF got beat up quite a bit in, in their discussions with RTD on Northwest Rail. Uh, we've actually got a meeting set for next week with Bill Van Meter with RTD. Bill is also one of our bosses on the, on the commission. He represents RTD. And we're going to sit down with Bill and his staff and, and start having additional conversations about how Front Range Passenger Rail can partner with RTD, uh, not only in the North Corridor projects, but also uh, coming up through the Southwest Corridor. Uh, that's going to be a, a key uh, access point for Front Range Rail to come into Denver from the south from Castle Rock. So uh, both Southwest Corridor and Northwest Rail are going to be uh, good opportunities for some kind of partnerships with the RTD. So we're looking forward to those conversations. Spencer and Randy, thank you very much for being able to educate us about uh, some of these long-term plans. Uh, these are indeed uh, you know, looking far ahead there, but they only become a reality if we start making plans and, and thinking about it now. So we'll all keep our fingers crossed on some of the funding opportunities and uh, keep us posted as we go forward. Okay, Thanks so much thank for having us, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Looking forward on the agenda there. It looks like uh, we're at comments for board members if I'm looking at the right agenda this time. Um, so we'll just go around uh, in the order that people happen to appear on, on my screen. So Sandy, you are up uh, uh, first on any comments from uh, from your side? Um, yes, that, that I'm, I'm really impressed with the front range passenger rail that uh, perhaps they to get something done that we haven't been able to do um, with RTD to get um, the bus, I mean, uh, to rail up to Longmont and down through the front, ra front range. Um, but back to the, uh, the CHIP program, um, I really appreciate all the work that went into it. I read every single one of those 25 um, proposals and the thought, the maps, the whole, um, connection with um, whether it's a comprehensive plan, Envision Longmont, whatever it might be, just appreciated how they wove everything together. Um, I was sad to see so many things unfunded, but 
but I know that we're working towards getting things funded. So thank you all for your, your work and the projects that you've done. So thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Sandy. Courtney, do you want to go next uh, in the comments from board members? Sure. Um, I'm also very excited about the potential for rail. I'm glad to hear that RD is uh, in communication with the other groups. That was one of my questions, whether they were involved in that or not. So very excited and echoing Sandy's uh, statements that uh, there's a lot of work going into all the projects that have been going. I mean, some of the dates on those projects date back many years that they've been ongoing and uh, just nice to see that they're still always in progress as it would always be as it would be. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. David, you want to go next? Uh, sure. I, I don't have anything new to add. I just I certainly appreciate all the work that uh, Bill, Tyler and me were doing to, to pull this together, mm -hmm. especially with our changing funding streams that we're having right now. Challenging times indeed. Yeah. Thanks, David. Chuck, you're up. All right, thank you. Um, I guess I'll echo the uh, rail service. It sounds really encouraging. Um, I've lived in two regions where we've had north-south regional rail through Amtrak, and they both have worked very well. So I can just throw that in there. The latest area I lived was the Vancouver, British Columbia to Eugene, Oregon, north-south, which is very similar. Uh, it goes along the I-5 corridor. And I've used it many times. And yeah, so I, I'm encouraged by what I've seen in the past. And if that same model could work here, I think it would be great. So uh, beyond that, I just want to say thanks to our staff for getting that traffic light in at Alpine and Mountain View. Very encouraged by that. I've been watching the progress uh, for the last couple of weeks. So thank you. And, and then also just a quick shout out uh, to Jim for that presentation. Very detailed, a lot of information there. And, you know, there kind of comes a time when you look at your experts that you have on staff and you go, yeah, uh, he knows so much more than I do about all of the nuts and bolts that are going into this. And I trust that this is the right decision to make. So just thanks to our staff. They, they do a top-notch job and try to balance between taking care of our assets that we currently have and looking for future developments in the future. So that's all. That's all I got. Well said. Thanks, Chuck. All right. To our new uh, Transportation Advisory Board members, uh, just to, uh, a little bit of context here. In this section of the agenda, we usually just reserve some time if there were uh, either any transportation issues of special note uh, from your perspective, any follow-up on past issues, any clarifying questions or things you've seen around town that you thought would be helpful to bring to the attention of our talented uh, transportation staff. So, Joe, I'll start with you. Um, welcome you. and uh, I can hear you just fine there. Any uh, uh, comments uh, that you want to add for the good of the order? Well, I think from my perspective, there's a tremendous amount to unpack uh, from a commentary standpoint. Love the presentation. Great information helped a lot. Um, don't think I'm really in a position at this stage to contribute or add a lot of comment, but give me time. Sounds good. All right, Liz, any uh, questions or comments on your side? I really want to echo what everybody was saying about the wonderful work that staff did. And also, I found that uh, front range rail presentation fascinating and exciting. Um, and that really was it. Sounds good. Sounds good. Only comments I'll add is uh, just to uh, to reinforce uh, uh, the point that we really do have, or fortunate in Longmont to have some really talented staff members on the transportation team, and um, it gives us great confidence there as they're presenting the issues they've uh, done uh, their due diligence on on different issues. Um, what I would encourage, uh, just for especially for for new transportation advisory board members. Um, our, our window of time oftentimes goes faster than the time allows for. So as you're thinking of uh, different comments or clarifications during uh, presentations and over the uh, the next year or two or three, um, really encourage uh, you and, and everyone for that matter 
uh, just to really be thinking about, you know, what are the uh, the one or two most important issues to be able to raise? Because certainly for every topic, there's an opportunity to ask clarifying questions that can get into the weeds there. So I'll do my best to make sure that we can end our meetings on time, but uh, I definitely encourage everyone to really think about how to prioritize the questions so we can get to the most important issues. With that, I'll hand it over to Council Member Peck. Thank you, Neil. Um, I, I just want to reiterate what everyone said. I, I think we've got the greatest transportation department and they're so easy to work with. Um, and I, I love this board. I have to say I do. You guys, uh, you care and, and it really comes through. But I want to give a real fast update on what's going on with RTD, if you don't mind. Um, the RTD board has whittled it down to three finalists for the director. And they're going to be giving uh, videos because we're in this COVID craziness that will be available to the public and you can comment on them. There, there are three women um, who are all incredibly uh, qualified for the position. Uh, we don't know yet when those videos are going to be made and available to the public. Uh, but what I would like is if, if you so, if you feel as passionate as I do about uh, the rail, to make sure that w when they are being considered for this position, that they understand how important the rail is to us, whether it's uh, partnering with the Southwest Chief uh, and Front Range Rail or and or finishing our line. Uh, the other thing is I think I, I asked, no, I'm sorry, I did, I asked for a letter from uh, the board about the FISA account, the Fast Tracks Internal Savings Account that you support keeping that whole and not putting it out for a bus operation. So I wanna thank you for that. And it looks like they are, uh, the, the board is leaning toward keeping that whole and not taking it. But there is one point that was new to me after working on this for five years, it was new, that there is, I think it's called the rubber tire um, fund or option where money is taken out of the fast tracks fund for bus operations and the board is considering over the next few years it's about 20 million dollars a year so that should have been the fast tracks fund all of this time which would have been a huge portion of the cost of all the unfinished corridors so that is being contemplated to keep that those dollars coming out at the at the cost of $20 million a year. Um, we need to keep on top of that and see if the board is actually going to do that. I know they're in a huge funding crisis, but um, these are two different funds that we that we voted on. So uh, that is a, a good thing to keep that. So uh, RTD through Governor Polis and Faith Winters and Matt Gray have formed an accountability RTD Accountability Committee. And this committee is to do a deep dive into all aspects of RTD, to for the management, for funding, for financial revenue, whatever. So um, just FYI that that is in, they had their first meeting yesterday or today, this morning. I'm getting my days mixed up. I also met with Randy Grauberger a couple of times and Bill Van Meter, and I'm very excited about this uh, Front Range Southwest Chief. And from my conversations, it looked like, unless that, that's changed, that the Northwest quarter would hook right into that when you saw that on the map where it kind of made that triangle into Longmont and Boulder. That was part of the, the Northwest corridor. So we need to keep on RTD to finish that. Um, and just as a uh, venting, I am frustrated with RTD in that they have a uh, that the Southwest Chief and Front Range Rail has the uh, BNSF director that we've been trying to get communication with for all these years, and they have got him on their board, DJ Mitchell. So that frustration, as soon as I saw that, I thought, are you kidding me? We've been asking RTD for five years or more, please get us in contact with DJ. So that did happen right before COVID. They went to Fort Worth and had that big meeting. So I, I, I'm hopeful that this will all come together, but I do, our city does need TAB to be part of that 
um, support group and advocacy. So I want to thank you very much and, uh, and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. All right, well, uh, in the last few meetings, we've had opportunity for people to keep others in the loop about transportation related meetings. Any info on upcoming transportation meetings on the radar? I don't have any at this point, Phil. Um, do you have anything coming up with Kaufman? Nothing with Kaufman, Tyler, but I did want to mention that uh, there's been some, excuse me, meetings that have been happening for the it's called the first and final mile along state Highway 119. And unfortunately, all the English speaking ones are now complete, but there is on um, Wednesday at 5 o'clock a Spanish only speaking um, event that's open to the public. And um, it's really kind of a new idea during this time of COVID where it's really difficult to do kind of translation services as easily as maybe you could with uh, you know, with a group of people in a, in a in more of a open house setting where you could ask people if they if they're more comfortable in Spanish speaking and then be able to um, speak to them directly. And so we we we're we're going to try this out. It's going to be interesting to see how it works. And so uh, we put the invitation out there. It's been on a, a number of different stations. So if any of you are uh, hooked into the Spanish speaking community in Longmont or along the corridor, quite frankly, it'd be great to get the word out even better than what we hope we've done. But um, this will show us something for sure. It's going to be a good proof of, you know, is this is this something that could continue and is something uh, that's that's needed. And I hope there's a trust level that's there that's built in as well that, um, you know, this is something where you can feel very comfortable just as as most of us would in an English only uh, kind of presentation. So the English ones went very well. There's probably twice as many more people that attended than we usually get for an open house. So we had two of those. One was an evening one, like the five to six that we're going to have Wednesday for the Spanish speaking. And the other one was a noon kind of a lunch hour meeting. We had 70 at the evening one and 35 at the lunch hour one. So that is probably about twice as much as we get. So this format's proving to be quite effective for people coming to participate. It's much easier, right? You're right in your house and you can just turn it off at any time or or you can stay tuned in and ask questions and there's some fun little survey things that happen on your on your smartphone and things. So we're watching very carefully. So as we start the Kaufman Street project, which will hopefully start before the end of September, um, that we are doing the same kind of outreach and, and hopefully getting more more and more people to tell us what they want in that corridor. And that's a busway corridor from 1st to 9th. It's fully funded with a, with a, with a federal grant. And so we're going to start design uh, again before September 30th will be the kickoff. We need to start spending money before the end of the. This fiscal year, um, federal fiscal year, so that'll happen and then that, that will happen. <laughs> and then in the fall, you'll start to see the public outreach events probably before Thanksgiving. And it'll probably be again on the, in this format and if we can tr transition. Early next year, you know, spring of next year, we're hoping to go back to some of the more traditional formats, but uh, I think you all understand where we are on that. Great. Give, appreciate that. Awesome. Well, on our items for upcoming agendas, I see that we have traffic safety fund, countywide sales tax, front range passenger rail, neighborhood traffic mitigation, and and uh, crash report. Um, Tyler and Phil, do I have that right? That's all happening next meeting or is that happening in upcoming meetings? This, this would be upcoming meetings, not necessarily all next and. Front range passenger rail, we missed the update on that one as well. That was tonight, so we won't be doing check. Sounds good. Well, we have lost the two. Um, great to see all of you uh, with that. We'll call the meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Good job. Thank you, Neil. Bye bye. Thank you. Good job, Neil. Thank you, Neil. Have a good one. See you all next month.